on behalf of the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. It gives me great pleasure to welcome Mr. Nandan Nanekli for his oral history. I hope I pronounced your name right. My name is Uday Kapoor, and I'm a volunteer in the oral histories program at the museum. Joining me is David Brock, director of the Software History Center at the museum. Nandan co-founded Infosys in 1981, where over the years he was president, COO, CEO, and co-chairman of the board before leaving Infosys in 2009 to serve as the chairman of the unique identification authority of India at the invitation of Prime Minister Dr. Manmohan Singh. As chair of UIDAI, he was responsible for implementing the biometric ID system to give a unique ID to all the residents of India. It was called the biggest social project on the planet. Nandan serves on numerous boards and is chairman of AICSTEP, a nonprofit literacy and numeracy platform. Nandan has invested in more than 12 startups, probably more by now, and is a generous donor to charities. He has won many prestigious honors. Uh, I won't mention all of them, including the Padma Bhushan. His book, Imagining India with a Forward by Tom Friedman, is widely acclaimed. So with that, uh, we'll begin. If I, there are any corrections, please tell me. No, that was perfect. So with that, let's begin with your early life. We typically want to uh, start with where you were born. I believe you were born in Bangalore. And let's start with that. Sure. Yeah, I was uh, born in uh, Bangalore, 1955, which I think was a good year for computer guys. A lot of guys were born in 1955. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I grew up in Bangalore till the age of 12. Uh, my father worked in a textile mill in Bangalore. And then the, the company that he was in had some difficulties. So he moved on and had a, a roving job because he would go to different cities working in these mills. And so he wanted me to have a stable education. So uh, I went to stay with my uncle in a small town called Dharwad, which is uh, midway between Bombay and uh, uh, Bangalore. And uh, I stayed with my uncle, had a wonderful time there, went to school, did my uh, first two years of college. And then I was very fortunate uh, to get admission in IIT Bombay. Uh, so in the year of 1973, I moved from Dharwad to Bombay to start living at the IIT campus. So we can come back to your uh, later education. Let's go back to your early childhood mm -hmm. and uh, learn a little bit about the environment yeah. with your parents and siblings and Sure. How, what kind of schooling, who were your mentors? So sure. if you could give us a little yeah. bit of So uh, as I said, I spent the first 12 years of my life in, in Bangalore. Uh, I do have an elder brother. He lives in uh, Wilmington, Delaware. Uh, he's eight years older than me. So when I grew up, it was almost like being an only child because by the time I grew up, he was already in college and he had left home. Uh, and so, but I had a very nice environment, uh, environment where uh, I was encouraged to read and learn. I, you know, I was a sort of a nerd went to the library, British Council Library, many libraries in Bangalore. And so, uh, so I had a very good time uh, uh, you know, in those 12 years. Uh, and I went to a couple of schools. I went to a school called uh, St. Anthony's, and then I went to Bishop Cotton Boys School, which yes, is a very, famous. very renowned school, a very old school in Bangalore. But then at the age of 12, uh, as I said, I moved to Dharwad. I joined a school called St. Joseph's, another good school. And uh, I had a wonderful experience. It was a, a different experience because going from a bigger city to a smaller town, but I made a whole new set of friends. Uh, and then I went to a very leading college in Dharwad called Karnatak College. Karnataka College is probably the oldest college in that part of the world. It's very, very famous. It's had a huge number of illustrious uh, alumni. Uh, and uh, I spent two years there. And in those days, uh, you know, uh, people who went to IIT were typically from large cities. Uh, they would be from Bombay or Delhi. They would be from very good schools. They would have, uh, you know, IIT coaching classes. And, you know, so a large number of them would get into IIT. It was not that common for people from smaller towns uh, to make it. But I was very fortunate that we had a cohort of people who all wanted to make that happen. So we all sort of studied together. And uh, I had a lot of my cousins who were in IIT. They gave me the hand-me-down books. 
So these bunch of guys studying together. I'm an IIT graduate too. Sure. IIT Delhi, 10 okay. years senior to you. Okay. And so I, I remember the environment. Yeah. And like you said, I came from a big city. Yeah. But uh, I hope I didn't have to go through that. But uh, <laughs> luckily in those days, there was less competition. That's true. I, I, oh, absolutely. <laughs> I, I made it only because there was no competition. Uh, less competition. So I think uh, that was, uh, I think for me, the first turning point was moving as a 12-year-old from Bangalore to the Harvard. Because I think at an early age, uh, I learned to be self-sufficient. Uh, I was no longer staying with my parents. I was staying with a very, very, very... Uh, hospitable and uh, affectionate family, my uncle's family, but my parents were not there. So I learned to manage by myself. I also learned to manage how to handle different environments. So I think the first big transition for me was that move where I spent six wonderful years uh, in, 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 in uh, Dharwad. And then at the age of 18, I went to IIT, which is another big transformation. Right, right. So I, yes, without uh, assumption, I'm sure you did well in all the schooling and did well in your results. Yes, I think I think I had a, uh, I had a, had a good, I mean, academic career uh, in my school and so on. So I did well both in Harvard and in uh, Bangalore. And also, uh, it was also a time when I realized that I had a lot of interest. So I was, I would read in widely. Fact, I was going to ask uh, your interest in engineering uh, versus arts. Uh, yeah. Did you, did well, you... I think, you know, I studied a lot, both fiction and nonfiction. And I think that was an era where uh, most young people uh, w would pursue a career in a professional school, either in engineering or medicine. In my case, I was uh, fortunate that I had a number of my cousins who were at IITs, and min many of them were at IIT Bombay. Uh, so I was very fortunate that uh, I had their uh, you know, mentorship uh, to help me, to advise me on how to make it to IIT. And uh, because they were all in IIT Bombay, uh, I decided to... Uh, join IIT Bombay uh, uh, because technically I could have joined any IIT and uh, my father sent me a telegram when I had to go to Chennai for my interview saying join IIT Chennai <laughs> Electri uh, Chemical Engineering or something like that. So at the age of 18 you want to do the opposite of what your father tells you. So I said no I'll join Electrical Engineering and IIT Bombay. <laughs> so that's how and of course I had as I said I had my cousins there. So I had a lot of affinity for uh, the IIT Bombay. You have any? May I ask you a little bit more about what you were reading as a youth and just to ask you if there's anything in particular, any sort of subject or genre or author that really strikes you as relevant to, you know, the way your life has unfolded? Yeah, well, no, I was, I read widely both fiction and nonfiction. Fiction, of course, the fiction of the day was well, Enid Blyton or William or all kinds of books that we had. But I also read science fiction, uh, Asimo and you know, people like that, uh, and uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. So I was interested in science fiction. And of course, I read on technology and science. I mean, at that time, I don't think I had any particular predisposition towards uh, computers. Uh, but I think it was a more wide-ranging uh, uh, sort of uh, reading habit. When, when did an interest in computers first begin to emerge for you? Oh, that emerged entirely at IIT. Uh, you know, because uh, do you want to switch to my IIT period or? Sure. Yes, I think that's a good segue. Yeah. So I think, you know, at the age of 18, I came to IIT Bombay. And that was, of course, uh, personally a very different experience for me. Uh, I, I was moving into a hostel. Uh, I was making new friends. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, at first I was a bit, uh, uh, what shall I say, I was not that assured about myself. So it took me time to get the self-confidence and so on. Uh, but over time, I became very confident, and uh, it was at that time that my interest in uh, computers uh, uh, sort of took off. And I think that technology had changed too. When I was in IIT Delhi, we didn't have computers, we had very little emphasis on software. Yeah. Most of it was IIT Kanpur. Yes, I, uh, I think it's important to understand, I think, what happened with the IITs. You know, each of the IITs had a different uh, country as a partner, and uh, the U.S. was the partner of uh, IIT Kanpur. Uh, and uh, in the case of uh, IIT Bombay, the partner was the, at that time, the USSR. Yes, right. And uh, so we had a computer called the EC1030, which is effectively it was a, uh, like a clone of the IBM 360. Uh, and I think, uh, so, and you know, those are the days when we entered our data using punch cards and tapes and so on. 
you give something in the night. I think the you'll enjoy the museum because we <laughs> have a lot of those era gadgets. So uh, I think you, you learned to, you, you sort of give your program, punched it, and gave it at night. In the morning, you got the output. And I think one good thing about that era for all of us was that was the time when computing was uh, scarce and expensive. And therefore, when you wrote, some, wrote a program, you really checked it and double checked it to make sure there were no errors. Because if you made an error, then you'll, you'll get the answer next morning and you lose a whole day. And therefore, I think that, that, that today, because computing is so uh, you know, profuse, so prolific, uh, people are willing to write something, give it to the computer, get it back, and then correct it based on that input. But those days, we had to be a lot more careful. So I think to that extent, I think those of us who grew up in that era had to be more rigorous in the way we thought about uh, things. I remember when I interviewed Mr. Murthy, uh, he was talking about his selection of control theory yeah. as the topic, which was my topic. Yeah. And I went to Seattle and you know, University of Washington with hoping to have a career. Yeah. Boeing laid off two thirds of his workforce <laughs> because they were cutting back. So I had to change from control yeah. theory because I was a mathematician. Sure. But anyways, so please. So uh, and at that time, uh, you know, in the 70s in IIT, there was no separate stream called computer science. Uh, all of us did double E, electrical engineering. And uh, we selected our choices through uh, electives. So I did take a lot of electives in computer science, but there was no computer science. In fact, there was no separate uh, computer science department. Uh, it was part of the doubly electrical engineering department. But we had some, the good thing we had was also IIT Bombay had some fabulous uh, professors. Uh, professor Isaac is a very legendary professor. Uh, then uh, Professor Deepak Fatak, who's still very active. And many, many professors uh, of, that, of, of that league. So I think, uh, and they were all quite young, so they're not that much older than us. So I think working with them uh, was a terrific experience. So that's how I got into I, uh, my you know, technology. But the other big thing which happened to me in IIT was the, uh, I built my uh, organizational and social skills uh, a lot, which in some sense came in pretty handy uh, later on because I, I became an organizer. Uh, you know, IIT Bombay had a festival called Mood Indigo which is even today regarded as the best student festival in the country. So I was the organizer of that. I was the general secretary. Uh, you know, I did lots of things. So I think doing all those things uh, gave me a huge amount of self-confidence and sort of street smarts in some sense. So it was both a technical education, but equally it was a social education yes. on collaboration, learning to deal with people, engaging with them, and so on. Right, and now I notice kind of going forward a little bit from yesterday's prize event, how much research is going on in IITs? Yes, I think that's a big change from the time that we went. Uh, I think, uh, I don't know, one of the things that happened in India, I think, was that, uh, you know, the research money started going to uh, government institutions. So the government set up research labs, and the CSIR system is a great example of that. But even in defense, it went to DRD and all that. And the IIT essentially became more uh, teaching environments and fantastic teaching environments. And obviously, IIT graduates have done very well. But the big shift that happened and uh, over the last uh, maybe 10, 15 years was a huge focus on also making IITs research institutions because people realized that you need both research and teaching together yes. to fuel the system. And also, you need a la larger number of PhDs. So earlier, it was more of an undergraduate institution. Now, I think it's great. So, and I've been involved subsequently on the, I was on the board of IIT Bombay. Uh, so we, I've seen how the transformation has happened. Uh, new departments, uh, more PhD students, more research, uh, more interdisciplinary work. So yes, I think you see a definite shift. Right. Uh, I, I noticed that Professor Paul Raj, who um, did uh, his PhD at IIT Delhi yeah. under Professor Indurasan. Professor Indurasan was our teacher as well. And uh, he's considered, uh, Professor Paul Raj is considered father of 4G. Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was kind of the beginning stages sure. of, you know, the th original thought. Yes. In fact, it's very, it's a huge coincidence because I spoke to Paul Raj this morning. <laughs> uh, and uh, Paul called me because uh, he's very keen that India become a leader in core technology. Uh, and uh, he's been doing a lot of work in preparing a plan he, on how... He and I have been communicating. Yeah, so and in fact, he was supposed to meet the Prime Minister. That's right. In fact, he called me this morning. Or rather, he, called, he sent me a message last night. I called him back in the morning saying that, uh, how do I, you know, how, how can we get this to move faster and so on. 
So it's very coincident that I just spoke to Paul Raj this morning. Thank you. Any? I just had one follow-up question about um, your engagement with software in particular while at university. Um, many people who have uh, been involved with software describe just uh, a kind of a, a joy and a pleasure when they're programming. Could you talk about your experience of programming and of creating software in particular? Yeah, no, I, th I think uh, definitely uh, I saw it as a creative process. I saw it as some place where I could uh, uh, actually create something that worked. I like the rigor of it, the fact that you have to do it in a very systematic way and that you have to make sure it was bug free and so on. So I think it certainly it, the, 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 the simplicity and the elegance appealed to me. Uh, and this was the time, as I said, this was before all the interactive computers came, right? This was in the 70s. So we didn't actually interact on a screen with a computer. We, we thought through the program and punched it in a card or a tape, submitted it and got the results next day. So I think, but still, I think the elegance of uh, the business of software was exciting even in those days. So uh, if we want to move on from IITs, um, I guess you first joined Putney Computer? That's right. And that's entirely thanks to Mr. Narayan Murthy. Okay. Because uh, it's actually interesting how, how, how your life moves, right? Uh, I was supposed to, uh, you know, the typical route in those days for IIT graduates was either to uh, go, to the, go to the U.S. and do a master's and then do something there, or go to one of the Indian Institute of Management, do an MBA and then, you know, become a business guy. And uh, it so happened that in, uh, in the December of 1979, I was supposed to do the entrance exam for the MBAs, but I fell sick. And so I didn't take that exam. And uh, I had uh, I'd taken a few more months to finish my undergrad. So I finished in November of 78. And I was really wondering what to do. Uh, and that's when I heard about this small company, uh, which was the agent uh, for Data General which at that time was this uh, very, very exciting mini computer company from uh, Route 128, Westboro, Massachusetts. And uh, uh, that's an, an interesting time because uh, IBM had just left India uh, and thank, because of the issues that uh, IBM and the government of the day had. My about, brother had joined IBM yeah. from the US yeah. and he had to go back. That's right. That. So, you know, there was a government which came uh, there was a minister called George Fernandez, and there were issues about how much equity they should dilute. And so IBM and Coke effectively left India at that time. So there was a vacuum of computing. And this was a time when the whole Route 128 belt of Boston had taken off. DEC was already a big company, but then there was uh, Prime, Wang, uh, you know, D you know, and Data, Data General. General. And uh, the Putney family uh, and Naren Putney, who unfortunately is no more, was based in Boston. And he had a very good relationship. He was at MIT, he had a good relationship with uh, the, the founders of Data General. So he had the agency for Data General in India. And Mr. Murthy was their software manager. He was, I think, the first employee. You can ask him more sure. about that. So I'd heard about this company uh, through the IIT grapevine. So I said, let me go check it out, some, some exciting new mini computer stuff. And so I walked into his cabin and uh, he had a small cabin in a building in Nariman Point, and uh, he interviewed me, asked me a few, you know, his, his style is to ask puzzles and so on. And then he hired me on the spot, a very unusual way to hire uh, someone. And so I joined under his uh, leadership uh, at Putney uh, sometime in uh, January of uh, 79 or thereabouts. And I spent, I was there till July of 81 under his leadership. So in terms of your experience when you joined Putney under Mr. Murthy, uh, what was it like and also the software group that was yeah. there? No, I think working under Murthy, with Murthy uh, in the period 1979, January to July 81 was probably the most exciting time uh, that I ever had uh, because he was an extraordinary boss. He believed that everybody should operate at the fullest potential. He gave tremendous freedom, empowerment, allowed us to do our job, make our mistakes. And we had the advantage that there was a data general computer which uh, the, uh, they had brought down. And uh, it was often not used in the nights. And for those of us who had grown up, you know, sending these cards to have a terminal where you could do whatever you wanted was like an unbelievable luxury. And therefore, I would work all night on that learning. And, and he encouraged us to learn a lot. 
So it was a terrific experience uh, working for uh, uh, Murthy at that time. And he, he was also a great believer in young talent. So, you know, he, he, so he had faith in young people. He had faith that they would learn and do the job, that he doesn't necessarily need people with quote-unquote experience. And so he assembled some fabulous, uh, and many, many of them are, you know, were part of the Infosys journey, like Chris Gopal Krishnan and every, actually everybody, the whole team. So I think uh, we, we had a terrific time together. I learned a lot. Uh, I used that time uh, to really upgrade my skills, become good at uh, programming, become good at databases. I also taught because part of the job was to, when people invested in the computer, that you know, teach. So, so I think overall it was a, it was a very well-rounded experience for me and one of the best times in my life. And what languages were you using? Uh, basically, it was COBOL basic in those days. Um, so was that, um, was there, how was the business uh, of Putney at that time? Was it growing or? No, it was growing. They had actually uh, multiple lines of business. One of those, of course, as the agency for Data General in India, uh, they sold these computers and uh, part of our job was to help you know, install that. But the other thing also was they did a lot of work for clients in the U.S. And that's how I got to go to Boston a couple of times and work with the Data General. I actually was at Data General for uh, almost a year. And uh, so, I, you know, uh, so I'd go every day from, I used to live in Cambridge and, you know, take the bus and go to Westboro, uh, Route 128. So I actually saw uh, how a, a company works. And at that time, Data General was a very scrappy young company. Uh, I don't know whether you remember uh, Data General. Uh, it was, you know, it came after DEC. And uh, uh, they, they, they're the original guys who put that famous ad. I don't know if they remember this ad. In the, I think in the Wall Street Journal or New York Times, uh, when uh, uh, you know, IBM came into the mini computer business. And it was something like, it said something like, if IBM entering a business legitimizes it, then the bastards say welcome, or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> so they were very scrappy guys. Um, so in terms of the work that Data General was doing, were they uh, outsourcing work to Putney yes. to do for them or were they doing it for clients? No, for themselves. So for the, themselves. the time I spent there, I actually went every day to the Data General office where I worked on some of the software work. Sure. Okay. So, um, of course, you were there for some time and a lot of you left to start Infosys. Maybe we can spend some time on that aspect. Yes, uh, you know, I, I think uh, uh, it was very, uh, it was a very, I'd say very, very exciting time, but, uh, you know, Murthy uh, always felt that uh, this was an industry of people, it was an industry of intellectual brain power expertise, and therefore that uh, a company in this industry should be set up by professionals, for professionals, uh, based on merit, attract great people, and so on. So he had a certain philosophy, and that philosophy was best done by being entrepreneurs. And most people, by the way, were very uh, skeptical about this. You know, in, in 1981, to be an entrepreneur in India was a brave, brave decision. And everybody dissuaded us and said, why, what are you guys trying? I mean, this is not you. There were a lot of restrictions on computers. There were computer restrictions, and he'll tell you more about that. Or, uh, and uh, it, you, know, you couldn't get foreign exchange to go abroad. You couldn't get a phone for two years. It, it was like night and day in those days. And uh, most people of our background were professionals with no capital, would take up a job or go abroad and you know, yes. stuff like that. So I think uh, there was a lot of uh, naysayers, a lot of people who said that we were crazy. But I think, uh, and the credit goes entirely to Murthy, that we stepped out. And of course, in some sense, your way to think about this is that he had the most to lose. Because at that time, he was head of the software group. He was obviously very paid very well. He had a great position. He was treated with respect. We were just younger. You know, so he was in his mid-30s. I was 25. So I think my ability, or the many of us who are all in our mid-20s, our ability to take risk was much uh, less. In a sense, we had nothing to lose, whereas he had a lot to lose. So I think it's to his credit that he stepped out and uh, you know, set this up. Could you speak a little bit more about, in the face of all of these kind of negative pressures, if you will, to, to, to um, founding a new firm, um, a little bit more about what gave the group the confidence that they could actually do it? Well, I think we got a lot of our confidence from Mr. Murthy. 
because he was our unquestioned uh, leader. Uh, he was willing to give up a very uh, well-paid job as the head of the software group at uh, Putney. He was very highly respected. Uh, and he was uh, absolutely committed to this idea. So that gave us tremendous confidence. And as I said, I think for the rest of us, especially the other founders who were in the mid-20s, the risks were a lot lower. We, you know, we, we, were, we, were, we were just two, three years out of college and uh, you know, we, we could take a gamble. In his case, I think it was very different. He was married, he was 35. Uh, he, uh, he, you know, he, he really took the big plunge. And another colleague of ours called Raghavan was a little older. So they really took the bulk of the risk. So I think we were sort of going along with the ride. I mean, and so we had so much faith in him that we had no doubt that we would do well. Well, I mean, you were all brilliant. And your, your contribution, everybody's contribution must have done the trick. You know, no, I, I think, obviously, I think uh, uh, the, the great sort of chemistry was that, uh, you know, I don't know whether you know, but he's a big fan of Western music. Uh, yes. You know, he, he, you know, he'll be listening to Beethoven or Mozart, uh, you know, some philharmonic orchestra or whatever. And I think uh, his uh, uncanny ability to assemble a group of people uh, were all individually good at something, but together were phenomenal. I think that was his great achievement. So he, when he assembled the founding team of Infosys, I think his ability to bring this team together and, and lead that was exceptional. So I think that's very, so I think it was the synergy of this group that also made a big difference. So uh, the center of gravity then changed from Mumbai to Bangalore? Well, it? that happened later. Okay. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, uh, when, when we began, Murthy actually opened an office in his apartment in Pune. And we all went abroad. So he was the only guy here. We were all sitting in Florida or somewhere doing some okay. uh, programming work for, for, uh, for a company which was a client. And Murthy was holding the fort here. And uh, he, he then, you know, he worked very hard, and he'll, he'll tell you more about it. And it's only 1983 when he landed a deal with Michael Bosch, which is a company here, to put a data general computer here that we moved here. So we moved here only, only in 83. But, and for me, it didn't matter. For most of us, it didn't matter. We were not in India at that time. We were essentially, from 1981 to 1987, I was in the U.S. Uh, uh, working on various projects of Infosys for clients, in the US. Okay. So that kind of was the genesis of the business model. That's right. Okay. That's right. So I think in the early days when technology was not uh, there yet, we had to actually go and do this work physically. The big shift happened in the late 80s. And the credit for that should go to Texas Instruments. Uh, because Texas Instruments, uh, there was an Indian guy called Mohan Rao there. Yes. And he was a pioneer. And he said that there's great talent in India, and we need all this software expertise. So he, he set up uh, India's first earth station uh, in a building on Miller Road in Bangalore called Sonar Towers. And, uh, and actually started having engineers sitting in Bangalore and connected to their centers in Dallas or Houston, wherever they were, and doing software over the satellite. So they were the pioneers. And then that movement grew dramatically. And uh, then uh, biggest investment that the government did strategically was to set up a range of earth stations. So the second one came up in Electronic City, and then they set them up all over the country. And that gave the impetus for doing development from here. So if you think of the first phase up to the late 89, we couldn't even do it. But after that, offshore, what became known as global software development became very popular. So the environment in Bangalore, uh, it was early days, and um, entrepreneurship was in its infancy, I yeah, imagine. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when did everybody move to Bangalore? Well, I think Bangalore is, uh, has historically uh, has had several waves of uh, technology. And in some sense, it's the valley has a similar thing, right? Mm. So if you go back and look at it, I think Bangalore benefited from extremely forward-looking rulers. Uh, and if you go back uh, more than 100 years, uh, the Maharaja was a very forward-looking Maharaja. He had prime ministers or diwans. Uh, who worked, uh, who were very forward looking. We Which had. Is the Maharaja of Karnataka? Uh, Maharaja of Mysore. Mysore. So the state of okay. Mysore. Mysore. And we had uh, people like Visheshwaraya, who's a legend yes. uh, engineer from here. Yes. 
So they, uh, and uh, it's very interesting that uh, the Indian Institute of Science yeah, in Bangalore. Was, when I talked to Mr. Ratan Tata and the yeah. legacy of Tata. Yeah. And that, that is, uh, it's a great example of a public-private partnership because it was a partnership between uh, Sir Jamshedji Tata yes. and uh, the Maharaj of Mysore. Mm -hmm. the, uh, they, uh, the Maharaj of Mysore actually gave the land for the university and he brought in some money and so they created the Indian Institute of Science way back in 1908. So there's always a tech, I mean, it, uh, like a, you know, it, ISC was like the starting point. And then the other big thing which happened was that uh, it became a center for uh, the huge public sector investments. I mean, pre-independence, for example, Hindustan Aeronautics was set up here by Walchand Hirachan. But post-independence, uh, when Jawaharlal Nehru came up with the idea of uh, uh, creating a strong public sector, uh, he chose Bangalore especially for high-tech and electronics. Mm -hmm. So you had the Bharat Electronics Limited, the Indian telephone industry. So you already had that and there's already a culture of that. So that wave happened uh, as part of the public sector wave. And then there was the computer wave of which we were among the pioneers. And there was also Wipro and others. So that happened more in the 80s. So there's been waves and waves of companies. And the latest wave is the startup wave, which is about 10 years old. So would you like to ask anything on the emphasis or should we? Um, yeah, I, I was just, um, I was curious to hear your thoughts about why the software industry in particular was able to um, flourish so, so particularly in India. Yeah, well, first of all, at least our generation of software companies were very, very globally focused. Uh, you know, we don't do that much work in India. We did it for the world. Right. And the reason, I think, is that starting in the 80s, uh, as computing, as IBM unbundled the software, you know, OS 360 from IBM 360, and then uh, I think also under pressure on the antitrust there to have people build software, Oracle came up and so on. And then the rise of the mini computers, Data General, DEC, uh, HP, and then the rise of the, you know, PCs and so on. So all that led to a dramatic surge in the need for software development. And software development still required you know, people and so on. And we saw that, and India was really a great place for uh, software skills because people here were, had a bias for engineering, mathematics. So there, there's an affinity in India. Uh, and it was a great, uh, in a country where domestic jobs were not that much available, being in the software export business was a great way to earn money. So I think all these factors came together and led to the rise of a whole uh, generation of companies, mm -hmm. TCS, Wipro, Infosys. Uh, and today that whole industry, domestic and exports, are 180 billion. Mm -hmm. So it's a massive industry employing uh, billions, uh, millions of people. And then apart from the Indian company that did well, it also became a base for global companies. So when Jack Welch came here, he started doing software from here. Then they set up the Jack Welch R&D Center, which is in Bangalore, which is the largest R&D center G has outside Schenectady in New York. Uh, then you have, uh, and now every major global company, be it a Cisco, JP Morgan, they all have large centers here. So suddenly all these sort of, you know, you know these critical masses happen. May I ask just one follow-up question please, to please. that? It, which is that um, all of what you describe makes perfect sense, uh, but the, the interesting ingredient to me in it that is necessary and that is kind of remarkable is that supply of engineering talent and the people who could do the software development. And that, um, that to me, that uh, whatever cultural forces or educational forces are behind that is is seems to me like a very essential ingredient to the story. Oh, absolutely. Any insight you have? Yes, about but actually, where it's that it's actually from? a chicken. It was it is actually what led to what. What is the causality? Yeah. See, so there was a you know already a culture of engineering talent, but that was that there are not that many. There were the IITs and there were what are called as the regional engineering colleges. Now they're called the National Engineering Techno National Institute of Technology. But what the IT revolution did, starting in the 90s was that the rapid growth of firms like Infosys led to, and a liberal policy of allowing engineering colleges to open up, mm. led to a massive increase in capacity of engineering colleges in India 
in the 90s onwards. And it became the profession of choice for young people because they could get jobs in this industry. So you had global demand for our services that led to the rise of firms like Infosys. The rise of firms like Infosys led to the need to hire thousands of engineers. Mm -hmm. The fact that such well-paying jobs were available created a supply side opening up and government policy encouraged that. Similarly, governments were quite liberal, especially in the southern states, to open up a lot of engineering colleges. So the engineering capacity in the country went up dramatically mm. between, say, 1990 to 2005. Hmm. So it's a virtuous circle yeah, yeah, of, of yeah. interesting or feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inter yeah. Fascinating. Thank you. So the other question that I have is on, I heard the term compassionate capitalism or in your uh, parents' description, father's description, Fabian socialism. Yeah. Uh, I read up on Fabian socialism that it is really a gradual, uh, you know, for people to accept growth and working together yeah. rather than a revolution. Sure. So, and I also learned that from uh, the Tatas, from Jim Sheji, that he was also a compassionate capitalist. Sure. So could you say a few words about that aspect with respect to running Infosys? Well, I think that was very much in our uh, DNA. Uh, Murthy himself, as you know, was, began as a communist who became a capitalist. Right. And the famous uh, incident uh, in Eastern in Europe. Bulgaria, whatever. So, and, uh, you know, we were all left-leaning in our younger days. So I think we were very clear. And also, we, in some sense, you can think of Infosys as a reaction to, uh, you, know, you know, if you look at, go back and look at 1981 India. You had three types of companies. You had large multinationals. There were global companies, you know, Unilever or IBM and that, that those are the global Western companies who had outposts here. And then you had large public sector firms funded by the government, mm -hmm. HAL, BEL, IT. And then you had large family businesses, the Tata's, the Birla's and so on. But the notion of first generation entrepreneurs with no prior history of entrepreneurship and no family ethnic background of entrepreneurship, which is very important. Setting up a company was a very new phenomenon. And we, in some sense, are the first startup of India, if you can think about it, yeah. or the first successful startup of India. Right. Because all of us were, uh, our parents were not business people. My father was a textile mill manager. Murthy's father was a high school uh, teacher and so on. Raghavan's father was a lighthouse keeper. You know, I mean, it was like, really, all very different backgrounds. So the notion that people who don't have a historic affinity for business could start a business and be successful without capital was a whole new concept. I remember this story when I think uh, an American, uh, I forget who it was, a, uh, business, uh, not uh, American business or political leader came to Delhi and he met a bunch of business guys and he asked everyone, what does your father do? He said, my father also does the same business. <laughs> so, you know, so he said, I mean, so, you know, it was a, so this whole notion that uh, people who are outside the system, outside the financial system or outside the business system can become entrepreneurs and successful is a whole new paradigm. And I think that was actually, in some sense, the, the greater social contribution of Infosys, that mm -hmm. it brought out what is possible. And it inspired a whole generation of entrepreneurs who said, if these guys who look like guys next door, if they can do it, we can do it. So I think the larger thing was it opened up the possibilities for first generation entrepreneurs. And we took a tour of the campus, and we'll talk more with Mr. Murthy yeah. about it because he's very proud of it. Oh, no, I think he's, uh, he's been extraordinarily, uh, you know, visionary on the campuses. I mean, tomorrow you'll see Mysore. I mean, that's, again, his brainchild. And uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the big things we did, and credit again goes to Murthy and people like Mohan Das Pai, was uh, build, uh, I mean, we have some 47 million square feet of office space. And we built campuses long before, you know, the Silicon Valley guys built. Uh, right. camp. Maybe some of them had, but maybe. But, you know, and campuses where you had a crash for babies, where you had a gym, where you had a swimming pool. This, we did this in the yeah, 90s. because they talk about that with Google yeah. and, you know, some microsystems doing that. But that came so much later. Oh, yeah, we did that in the, this campus began in 92. Right. That's a long time back. It's amazing. Very, very, very impressive. So uh, maybe you could say a few words about how you left Infosys sure. and then we can come back to 
Yeah. So I think, uh, as I said, I had a phenomenal uh, time at Infosys. Uh, uh, you know, we, we had the first 10 years where we grew slowly, then we, next 10 years, we grew like a rocket. We went public in India, and he'll talk about that. We went public in the NASDAQ. Uh, and so we had a wonderful journey. I was the CEO uh, in, from 2000 into 2007. Glory years, company growing very well, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, uh, I stepped down as CEO and my colleague Chris became the CEO. I became the co-chairman. And I also at that time was looking at larger issues of India and I wrote my book, Imagining India. And in that book, I talked about digital ID and how an ID for everyone will have a big difference. And I had been doing some work in the public space in the sense I was uh, involved in public policy, though I was a business guy, but only part-time. I worked in Infosys. And uh, sometime in 2009, the government, after a lot of deliberations, three other deliberations, decided to set up an ID project. And, uh, uh, but to just rewind a bit, so in 2009, May, the, uh, the elections happened and the UPA, which was the Congress-led government, actually came back with a better performance. And I was approached by them uh, to become the HRD minister saying that we need someone to do work on HRD, but I, I didn't get that job for a whole variety of I, reasons. You call it successfully lost the election or yeah. something. No, that was, that was later. This was the okay. uh, job as the HRD minister. Okay, okay. And then the prime minister got back to me and said, is there something else you'd like to do? Oh, okay. And then I suggested, let me do this ID stuff because that's, you know, it's technology and you know, it suits my interest. They said, yeah, why don't you do it? That's how I ended up in July 2009. I joined the government, and because I'd written about it, they said, okay, walk your talk, you know, actually make it happen. And that's how I joined the government. I spent four and a half wonderful but very challenging years in the system and built this uh, platform, which was both technologically very sophisticated, but also politically very complex to execute in this sort of chaotic world. So we was Nada Muni one of the guys? That yes, 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 Srikant Nada Muni. Actually, I assembled a fabulous a set of people, and I think one thing I learned from the Infos experience is you can't do anything unless you have a bunch of great people. And I assembled uh, two sets of groups. I assembled guys from the private sector. So Srikanth was a Valley guy, had worked in Sun Microsystems, health, Healthy On, Intel chip design, whatever. And he had come back saying, I want to do something in India. Uh, Dr. Pramod Verma, who was an architect, was again had worked in Infosys and then had done a startup in, in, in Boston. Uh, Vivek Raghavan was again IIT Delhi, computer science, robotics from Carnegie Mellon, startup in Valley, he had come back. Jagdish Babu was a chip guy from Intel. So, you know, we had some very good talent on the private side, but I had equally good talent on the government side, which is as important. And my CEO was a guy called Ram Sevak Sharma, uh, uh, MTech, MS from, uh, MTech or MS from ID Kanpur, MS from UC Riverside and an IAS officer who did programming as a hobby. So he was my CEO. He's the, currently the chairman of the TRAI. I see. He's, uh, he heads the telecom regulator right now. And people like that, uh, a lady called Ganga who was our CFO, and great talent. So I think my sort of value addition was I assembled a bunch of people who are technology guys, like almost like valley guys, who are from the private sector, who are very good. And I assembled a team of bureaucrats who are also extremely good and blended this together. And it was not easy because they, they came from very different cultures mm -hmm. and a lot of mistrust in the beginning. But the fact that we are all working together for this huge thing brought everybody together. Right. So the, uh, the ID, unique ID system, uh, how did it do and where is it now? Uh, yeah, when I said briefly, I yeah, so I, I think uh, uh, basically I worked in the government for four and a half years. Uh, and I brought it up to about 600 million people were issued the ID. And we built a platform all using open source, highly scalable, you know, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, when I left, uh, uh, the new government came and I met Prime Minister Modi. And he was a big supporter of that. And he's taken it forward. So today we have 1.2 uh, to 1.25 billion people with the ID. Uh, so it's the world's largest ID project. Uh, it is also the world's largest, it's linked to the banking system. So 600 to 700 million people have linked the bank accounts to the ID. And government does electronic transfer into these bank accounts. So India's world's largest uh, cash transfer system in the world is also in, in India. And then we provide online authentication. 
so I can use my ID anywhere and verify my ID that that is a few billion transactions, uh, you know, a billion a month transaction. It's a massive, so highly scalable has system. Has there been any criticism or other because there have been some... No, no, there's been a lot of back and forth on uh, privacy, this, that. But actually, by and large, it's uh, come out uh, very well. In fact, just yesterday, I did a piece in the Times of India. Uh, recently, there's a report came out, 10 years of Aadhaar and how, what's the impact it has had. And 92% of Indians approve of Aadhaar. So that's pretty, I don't think many people can get 92%. <laughs> yeah. Certainly. So I think, uh, I mean, it, it had its challenges in many ways, but fundamentally it's made a huge impact. So that was a big contribution I did. But I also did a few other things. I designed the payment system called UPI, which is a very, very, I designed in the sense I led it. I'm not, I, won't, I won't take the sole credit. I helped uh, visualize it and worked with people like Pramod and NPCI who actually built it. And that's become a billion payments a month, 1.2 billion payments a month. I worked on uh, uh, data empowerment, so something called account aggregators. I had headed a group that led, led to the original design of the fast tag, which is the electronic tolling system. I built the original architecture for GST. So I did, a, since I was in the government and you know, I had time on my hands, I sort of laid the foundation for a huge amount of uh, digital infrastructure for the country. Yeah. So that I basically did from 2009 to 2017. And even today I'm involved informally from sure. that. And then in 2017, what had happened was... Uh, Could I ask you one more question? Sure. So in terms of the technology for the unique ID and the way it's being run right now, have they utilized any of the big data and data oh, analytics? Yeah. Oh yeah, this was... In 2009, we were the first project, I think probably in the country, which used a completely open source stack. So we used Hadoop, MySQL, uh, MQ series, uh, obviously Apache, Linux, that whole stack. And uh, uh, we built it all using uh, you know, these kind of analytic tools. Uh, uh, I think today they probably use Druid or something. I forget what they use now. But it was a completely open source stack. And that's also why it worked. So we designed it using the infrastructure which is inside these Silicon Valley companies, but applied it to a very different purpose. Okay. Thank you. Please yeah. So then in 2017, uh, and I actually at that time I, I, I thought my Infosys journey was over because I'd moved into all these other things and I was doing that. But what had happened is uh, after Murthy had stepped down and the other founder had stepped down, we had uh, a new leadership and then there were some some things and you know I ended up becoming uh, the only guy everybody said okay fine this guy should do this stuff because I was acceptable to all the parties so that's how I came back as the chairman in August of 2017 and so I've been here for the last two years leading this company as a non-executive chairman. Yeah so what's the difference between executive and non-executive chairman? Well you know first of all uh, we have a very very competent and efficient CEO who actually runs the business. So Salil Parekh is also from ID Bombay, uh, great guy. So he runs the business. I'm not involved in the business. Uh, where I contribute is really, uh, I, and I, I, I come here one day a week. So it's, uh, I don't spend that much time. But where I contribute is strategy, thinking about the future, and also providing the overall governance. So, but I don't, I'm not involved in operations at all. Okay. Could you talk about how the strategy for the firm has has changed over that time when you were doing all these activities in government. Um, how does Infosys look, you know, from a strategic point of view yeah. today versus... Yeah, so well, well, I think the big change is when I left. Think about timing, right? I left in July 2009. Now, the big consumerization of uh, the industry happened around the same time, right? So. The iPhone was launched in uh, 2007, mm -hmm. uh, Android was launched in 2008, the smartphone had just become, uh, you know, just started, uh, clouds were just starting, AWS was there, but the others had just launching the clouds. So I think the big change between the time I was here and the time I came back was one, consumerization and the rise of the smartphone, 3.5 billion smartphones, the rise of the cloud, the rise of open source, big data analytics and so on the huge rise of AI, deep learning, and all that. So I think I had seen that from the outside, but I had applied my mind to applying it to public purposes. So what I realized when I came back was that 
there was this big shift. And what had begun in the Valley companies, the Googles and the Facebooks, now applied to every company. Every company had to become agile. Every company had to become digital first and so on. So I think the big realization for us is that how does Infosys be useful to our large clients in helping them in their digital transformation? Mm -hmm. And so I think what we have been doing over the last two years is gearing up in every possible way to be able to help our global clients. Because our clients globally tend to be incumbent companies in their industries. So large utilities, large banks, large telecom companies. So they are facing the digital pressure as much as anybody else. So we see our role as being their trusted advisor and navigator to help them make their digital transformation happen. So in some ways, there's a continuity because you were, you were performing that function for your clients in the earlier phase. This is just the, the current phase of the yes. digital transformation. That you but, but I think this phase is bigger, more strategic, more uh, disruptive for them and uh, also more uh, threatening to their business model. I mean, you know, we have been doing tech for large companies for years, but, and I've been in this industry for 40 years, but I've never seen this level of uh, concern, paronia about, you know, because fundamentally what the Valley guys have done is gone beyond their, you know, existing models right now you have driverless cars or you have you know you have uh, you know streaming of television uh, you have uh, banking on your phone so every it's so it's gone beyond retailing of course we saw with amazon so every industry is getting affected so if you are a large bank you worry about whether some big tech company is going to do banking if you're a large automotive company you worry about whether waymo is going to make driverless cars then what happens to us so this, this fundamental existential threat of the digital world is hitting everyone across the world. So, so while it is a continuation in the sense that we continue to do what our customers want us to do, in the level of change, the speed of change, the level of disruption, and the level of concern about their existential future is unprecedented. I wanted to ask you if I could to to talk a little bit about um, the background to the ID program, um, and this is maybe for the benefit of other people looking at this or reading this who are like me, who initially I didn't properly understand the importance of identification in the context of India, with this idea of the the formal and the informal sectors and the sort of critical place of provable identity in that. So if you could, um, I'd just love it if you could expand sure, a little sure. bit yeah, on absolutely. how profound the need yes, is yes. there. Yes, no, let, let me explain why this ID was required. And there are two, there were two drivers for this ID. One is inclusion. And the other is efficiency of public service delivery. And they're actually complementary in some sense. The inclusion challenge, uh, which is, by the way, a common not only in India, but in many parts of the world, is that countries in Asia, Africa, and so on, don't have robust birth registration systems. So in the North America or Western Europe, when a baby is born, the baby is registered. And there's a historical reason for this because of, whatever, 1,500 years, 500 years back, so on. So today in the Western, in Western countries, you have 98% registration of births. So once you have a birth registration, then you have a birth certificate. And then the birth certificate becomes your basic life document. It establishes where you were born, when you were born, your age, your citizenship. It's all rooted in the birth certificate. And you have only one birth certificate. So you're also unique. You have, you have only one. Now, what has happened in countries like India is that our fundamental civil registration system of births itself and deaths is, is, has gaps. And the many states in India where even today half the babies are not registered. Mm -hmm. So when you don't have a birth certificate and no way of proving who you are, now that's a huge challenge. Now, it did not matter perhaps in the earlier days when you spent your entire life in one village or one city 
and you were not dependent on any formal stuff, you're all informal. But today as people migrate, they migrate from North India to South India, East India to West India, Rural India to Urban India, and everything requires an ID. To board a train, you need to show who you are. To get a bank account, you need to show who you are. To get a job, you need to show who you are. When the policeman stops you on the road, you have to have some proof of who you are. So having some kind of an identification becomes very important. And how do you do it in a country where you have a starting stock of people, hundreds of millions of people with no ID? And the only way was to, and how do you make sure they get a unique ID? They get only one. That's the hard part. And the only way you can do that is with biometric deduplication, by saying that everybody has a unique biometric signature, and therefore if the same person tries to register twice under two different names, the biometric signature will establish it's a duplicate, which is what we did. So that is the inclusion argument, how to get everybody into the system and have an ID for them. And the second reason was that as the government built a welfare state, as the government created more and more programs to give benefits to people, they found that without an underlying ID system, they couldn't identify beneficiaries. And therefore, many, many of the beneficiary lists had a lot of fake and duplicate, leading to a lot of wastage and corruption. Think about the US. In the US, the social security number began because of the Social Security Act in 1936 in, as part of the whole Roosevelt uh, administration. And they had to have a way of having a person pay into Social Security while he was working and then get the benefits when he retired. And that's how they had to have a way of tracking him through his life, which is how the SSN came about. So all these are led by similar needs. So a combination of inclusion on one end and, and efficient delivery, both of them made it a politically compelling reason to do this project. Thank you. So I had a, just a short follow-up question, <clears throat> and then we'll come back to a different topic, which is that moving forward, you know, I don't want to go into the politics, but there, there are different ways of the citizenship, uh, being, citizenship being established. So and they're saying it's not related to Aadhaar because that's just unique ID. Here's they're establishing the background and the religion. Do you have any comment on that? Well, I think the issue of citizenship is uh, it's going down a slippery road. And it actually leads to what the work I did, right? See, one thing you have to say in the Aadhaar case, we were very clear that Aadhaar is not a citizenship ID. It only says John is John, Adam is Adam, Ashok is Ashok, Muhammad is Muhammad. That's it. We did not get, in fact, the information we collected on name, address, date of birth, sex, email ID, phone number, and biometrics. We don't col collect religion, ethnicity, not, nothing. And so it's really a way of saying John is John. And part of the reason is that government felt that we have to fix the ID issue. But also because proving citizenship goes back to birth, and if you have hundreds of millions of people who don't have a birth certificate, how on earth are they going to prove the citizenship? So I think uh, citizenship is a treacher, is a, is a slippery slope. Yeah, I understand. So uh, the other thing I want to mention is I listened to your TED talk and I read the foreword by uh, Tom Friedman uh, to your book and I was just ready to join you. I mean, it was so impressive. Uh, and you are very visionary about India's future and the strength. Um, maybe say a few words about then and now. You know, it's been a few years since yes. that has happened. Yeah, no, I, I wrote my book in 2008-9. And it was also, if you go back and look at it, that was the decade of massive globalization. In fact, I had given the thought to Tom Friedman, which led yeah, to the, the book, The World is Flat. Is flat. Yeah. So that was a period of... You know, globalization, China had joined the WTO, the world economy was booming, uh, India was booming, Infosys was booming. So it was also a time of unbridled optimism. And in some sense, my book is a reflection of that era. However, 10 years later, I think on different dimensions, uh, I think we are having a number of uh, introspection. One is, of course, globalization itself, uh, because of the, uh, uh, in some sense, because of the uh, fact that middle classes in the West didn't benefit from globalization as much as others did. 
So there's a pushback on that. So globalization itself is taking a pushback. We are having a pushback on technology. There's a whole concern about technology, data gathering, privacy, surveillance, all that stuff. Uh, India itself is going through uh, you know, uh, different kinds of new politics. So I think uh, I, I would not be as optimistic today as I was, say, 10 years back. Maybe I'm older also. But I think I'm still an optimist. I still believe that uh, uh, India has a phenomenal future. However, it's not a done deal. It's not automatic. And that a lot of things have to be done in our politics, in our society, in our economy to get the benefits of this. The, the, see, India still has the unique demographic dividend. That hasn't gone away. And it's the only young country in an aging world, especially with China now aging, again, thanks to the one-child policy. And therefore, I think India has a huge opportunity. But it's not automatic. We have to execute on that. So the technology-based governance that you wrote about, that still stands. Oh, that oh, absolutely. I mean, if you look, if you look at my work in the last decade, it's all been about putting in population scale technology, which was identity payments, and that is huge, you know, because that's that's the only way I think that we can change the lives of a billion people. So that part very much stands. Okay. Unless you have uh, just one uh, with this whole notion of the India stack, which I've. Or, you know, that incorporates you know, payments, data empowerment, all these things we've been talking about. I was very intrigued with the notion that not only is this a solution or a way forward for India, but also a model for other countries. Oh, yeah. And I, I was, and I, in the talk that I saw by you, you were mentioning um, maybe other places in Africa or de the developing world. Uh, it struck me that, you know, there would be important elements of this for the West. Oh, yeah. Uh, could, you, could you talk about Yeah, that? yeah. Uh, I don't know whether you saw a recent talk of mine on this. Uh, is that the recent talk, yeah. the one on three big ideas? Exactly. Uh, yeah. So no, I think all these three are valid. I think identity, having a digital identity, which is neutral, which is not collecting information about where it's used, is very important because mm -hmm. that's a way of protecting your privacy. And having a digital ID like Aadhaar means I can use it without you know, it creating data about where I'm going on the web. So there's a big benefit. So ID is a big part of it. But Western societies are not that comfortable with governments issuing IDs. So, so there's that issue. But fundamentally, we think ID is very important. Payments also, what in India has done is very, very useful because it's created a model of payments which does not create uh, winner-take-all models. Mm -hmm. So the UPI actually has five or six companies competing and innovating, including Google, WhatsApp, uh, phone pay, Paytm, and so on. So I think if you want to create a market which is uh, not a winner-take-all market, where there are a lot of people competing and there's innovation happening, then UPI is a good example. And two recent things that have happened actually support this. One is uh, Google has written to the US government saying that the Indian UPI model should be adopted by the Fed for their real-time payment system. So that's, so that's like they want to take our model and apply it to the U.S. Because the Fed in the U.S. Has, is planning a real-time payment system called FedNow you know, by 2024. And they said this is a good architecture. And the BIS, which is the Bank of International Settlements, which is a group of central bankers, has just published a paper on how the India model is globally applicable. So yes, on payments, that's there. A third big thing which is happening, which is also very, very important, is that we are the only country in the world which is an architecture for data empowerment, where people can use their own data for their benefit, as opposed to it being used to sell to you or to show you an ad or whatever. And this inversion of data, where individual consumers and individual businesses are empowered, is actually a very, very big idea. It's at the early stages of the rollout. But I think this has huge implications, and it's absolutely applicable for the rest of the world. Thanks. So, I was going to go to the next step, which is your current activities. I think I read about Ick Step yes. and your other uh, investments. Uh, we can go into everything, but please sure. tell us about yeah. your. So I think the way to think about this is that I have a set of activities in the private sector space, and I have a set of activities in the public space. And in fact, my public activities are more than my private. The private is really at three levels. One is as the chair of Infosys non-executive chair leading the board, which I spend maybe 20% of my time. Uh, then uh, I have a bunch of startup investments where I help a few companies. I did that to understand 
this new world of startups because I had not done this before and you have to do it to get know what's happening. But I, I no longer invest in startups because uh, the ones I have are quite good and you know I'm learning from that. And then one of the lessons I learned while doing startups is that while there are a lot of startups, scaling them up is a different league. Mm -hmm. So I've set up along with a guy called Sanjeev Agarwal, also an ex uh a fund for scale up of companies. Uh, so we invest, it's a $100 million fund, we invest in key companies, but not just giving money, but helping them think how they should scale up. So three levels, Infosys, uh, my fundamentum, which is my fund and my startups. On the public side, I do a large number of things. Uh, obviously, uh, the ID is now well established, payments is well established. Currently, the account aggregator framework for data empowerment is just rolling out, so I'm helping to evangelize and get it going. Uh, we have a foundation called XStep, which is looking at how to transform education using digital methods, which is partnering the government uh, for uh, you know, learning at scale. Uh, it's also being used for skills and other things. Uh, then I'm working... Um, There's a whole activity at the museum with STEM, uh, which may be very sure, interesting sure, to share. Sure. And then uh, I'm part of a volunteer group called iSpirit, which is looking at how India can have a next generation health architecture using tech. And uh, so I do a whole host of other things which are essentially in the public space. All of them have the common theme, which is how to change society at scale, what we call a societal platform thinking, using a tech backbone. Wonderful. Anything from you? Um, so if not, and I have another one. Okay, please do. Okay. So Moving to another uh, area, because we do have limited time, which is uh, philanthropy. Um, I read, uh, you're being very generous, you, you and your wife Rohini announced that you will give away you know, half your uh, wealth, sure. let's say. Sure. Maybe you could say a few words about the activity. Yes, we have always been uh, philanthropically minded. I mean, uh, when we first came into wealth, uh, I mean, that probably even now the biggest contribution to ID Bombay as part of my yes. giving back. Yes. Uh, but, uh, you know, and we have been doing philanthropy for last 20 years. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, and, but Bill Gates is a, is a good friend and uh, uh, he's been a great, uh, uh, you know, we work, we work closely together because a lot of the work he does in education and in uh, financial services also I do. So we work closely together and uh, he encourages us to join the giving pledge. So we are members of the Giving Pledge. There are about four Indian families who are members of the Giving Pledge. You have uh, the Prem, Mr. Premji is a pioneer, uh, Kiran Mazumda Shah, uh, Mr. Menon from Shobha Builders and ourselves. And so we signed up for the Giving Pledge and we have found that a great experience because uh, uh, you know, you're now with a group of around 200 uh, philanthropists who all made the same commitment. And therefore, working with this group led by Bill Gates, Melinda Gates, and Warren Buffett and, uh, has been a terrific experience. And uh, we also do a lot of what we call as uh, co 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 -philan collaborative philanthropy. Uh, we are all investors in a philanthropy called Co-Impact. So you have Gates, us, Skoll Foundation, which is Jeff Skoll, and uh, a couple of uh, Rockefeller Foundation. And we all collectively pool our capital and do big projects. So, you know, that's a big part of what we do. Because there are other industrial families or corporations like Tata's, they also have, uh, you know, big investments in different... Oh, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if there's any collaboration... Oh, yeah, yeah. I work... Actually, uh, Ratan Tata and I do some joint work. Uh, Ratan Tata and I have jointly set up a company called Avanti to look at how to provide financial services to the underserved. Uh, and he and I uh, set it together. So I work with him on that. And that's also driven by philanthropic goals. How do we get people who have no access to financial services? So, uh, and of course, uh, Tata's have been pioneers and so on. So absolutely work with all of them. We work with Mr. Premji. So, you know, I think all the philanthropists in India are in close touch with each other. Wonderful. Do you have anything else? Or I have. Um, I, well, I, d I would like to hear your thoughts about where you see this whole story of technology taking the world as you look forward from today's vantage point. That's yeah. kind of a very metaphysical Broad. question. <laughs> but no, I no, I, I, I think, you know, I think, you know, I, on the one hand, I'm a great believer that technology uh, can and 
it's probably the only way we're going to s solve a lot of the challenges the world faces, be it uh, poverty, be it, uh, be it uh, environment, you know, be it everything we have. At the same time, I think we become more aware that technology also, if it's not applied the way it should be, can also lead to a lot of challenges. And so I think uh, while technology is a great force and it's only going to become a bigger force, I think we equally well have to think about how to make sure that we deploy it in a way that's pro-people in some sense. And I think a lot of the work I do is actually that kind of work. Professor Amitar Sain's talk yesterday yeah. on friendship and yeah. uh, technology right. connection yeah. uh, was amazing. Yes, absolutely. So I think uh, 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 a lot of the work I do is actually how to deploy technology to empower people. And you know, when you, you have to think, it's not automatic because technology also has a massive concentration capability. So you can end up with concentration risk. Whereas if you do it well, it democratizes. So my work is on democratizing technology. It's wonderful. So uh, one other thing that I'd like you to comment on is how would you advise the new generation of people what they should be doing, how they should be doing? Uh, even entrepreneurs? Entrepreneurs or just somebody who's seeking a new career? Just kind of. Well, I think, you know, we are, first of all, I, I think uh, I'm very excited, but then I'm a perennial optimist. So I'm very excited by possibilities. And I think young people coming today into the world of careers have huge opportunities. At the same time, I think uh, the bar is raised uh, because uh, it's a very competitive world. Uh, people have to be always up to date. So I think we are in the era of lifelong learning. I think the notion that you got a degree and then you got a job and did something is, is over. We have to be prepared to learn all the time. So I think uh, you need a mindset of uh, what uh, uh, you know, uh, Satya Nadella has been promoting, which is actually Professor Carol Dweck at Stanford. The idea of a growth mindset that we keep, you know, growing, uh, keep learning, keep getting better. So I think that's very important uh, uh, learning that we need to always, we, we can't sit still, we have to be current. And I think certainly as entrepreneurs, I think uh, they're a huge opportunity again. Uh, but I do believe at the end of the day, running a business is about creating profits and cash. And so many of the young businesses today, while they grow, they do it by spending more than they have. So I'm always of the view that that's great to create a market share, but ultimately we have to have a path to profitability. Right, very, very wise. So unless you have anything more, uh, thank you so much thank for you. your time. It thank you so wonderful. much, I hope. Thank you, thank you very and much. You're very, we really would like you to visit the Yes, museum. yes, next time I'm in uh, California, Yes. I shall come.